Welcome, artistic friends, to Monet Cafe, your happy place to learn art from the convenience of your own home. Join me today for a fun new pastel technique where I'll be using acrylics and soft pastels. I created these two paintings that I'll be sharing a tutorial on what to do and what not to do using this technique. It definitely was a lot of fun, so let's get started. Hello and welcome friends in Monet Cafe. Join me today for more experimenting. And this is good for artists of any level. Uh, you know if you've been on my channel long, I love experimenting and finding new ways to do things, often new ways to economically do things. Not always, but it's always good to save money. And so today I have uh, in this experiment um, some successes and some, I wouldn't call them failures, but just some ways that I've learned I will do it differently the next time. And I'm going to be using a product. Um, this company, uh, bless their hearts, Arteza keeps sending me um, products of theirs kind of to experiment with and make a video. So I'm like, okay, why not? <laughs> but um, anyway, this is an acrylic pad. It's for, well, acrylic or oil painting. And it's this nice thick paper that's got a little uh, texture to it. And I thought, hmm, my pastel brain started thinking, could we make this maybe a pastel surface by doing an acrylic painting and applying clear gesso over it? And indeed we can. So uh, join me how I show how to do it and how not to do it. All right, let's get started. All right, so what we will be using for the acrylic portion of the painting is the Arteza Artist Paint Set of 60 colors. That's a lot of colors. As always, I like their presentation. This box is really nice along with their, their other watercolors and gouache sets they've sent. But this is considered the premium quality. It is acid-free and archival. It's of good quality. I love the little colors they have on the top there. It makes it convenient. Now, I do like, these are these tubes, by the way, are a little bit bigger than the um, watercolor or the gouache. Um, nice, ample supply. I like how they have them divided by color families. And I also like that particular one right there. It's kind of some neutral, some different varying values of grays if you just wanted to do a value study. Um, now, this is the acrylic pad. I guess I should say um, acrylic or oil or pastel now that I've used it for that. But it's a great quality paper. Again, it's the premium set 16 come in each pad. And uh, it has a little texture to it, and there's a nice thickness to the paper as well. And uh, I really did like this product. I'll definitely use it again. I'll probably experiment more with different ways to use it. Um, but it, it ended up with a really nice kind of sturdy surface to put uh, your artwork on. Here's another product that I wanted to share. It's a product I've used with acrylic painting in the past that I really like. It's called the Gray Matters Paper Palette. It's a palette, actually, on paper. Uh, for you to actually put your paints on and it's disposable so you can just throw it away when you're done and the gray is a nice neutral color for you to put your paints on rather than putting it on white and again this is made by jack richardson i love their pastels um, but it basically like it says here color mixing guide um, and i'm going to open it up here so you can see it so it's basically just these slick um, pieces of paper i can't remember how many is in a pad um, that you can just use as a palette. Squeeze your paints on and then you just, it takes water obviously, and then you just throw them away when you're done. Very, very convenient if you don't want to have to pull out um, a palette all the time. It also has on the inside of the front cover this very handy guide to color. If you're not familiar with acrylic or oil painting and color mixing, I happen to love color mixing, although we don't get to do a lot of it with pastel painting. But this is a really neat guide that you might find handy, and I'm going to show you a little more about that in a minute. Here are the colors that I've chosen, and while it may look like a lot, <laughs> uh, because Arteza was nice enough to send me this large set, I thought it would be nice to use a, um, an overabundance of color with acrylics a little bit more than I would typically use. Um, now, that's different from pastel painting in that with the pastel medium, you do need a lot more of your color choices and value choices uh, because they don't mix the same. With acrylic or oil painting and watercolor painting, and gouache painting, you have the ability to mix colors. So often, that's one advantage about those mediums is that you can actually have fewer uh, choices to mix different colors. I'm going to show you in the um, actually on the page of the gray matter paper palette 
how it has the nice, this is by Jack Richardson, by the way, who makes some beautiful pastels. Um, it has on the inside page this wonderful color chart here that if you need a little lesson in color theory or the color wheel, um, this is, is done nicely. Um, it's showing... Uh, using either colors from acrylic or oil painting. Uh, the primary colors are the ones with the P on it. So you've got a, a nice, um, just kind of a common yellow, um, a nice ultra, well, where's the blue? Primary is the phthalo blue, phthalo blue or Prussian blue. Um, sometimes I'll use ultramarine as a primary and alizarin crimson. Okay, notice how that makes a triangle. So these are your primary colors. And the reason they're primary is you can't use anything to mix to get a red or the primary blue or the primary yellow. You can mix some colors together to get the secondary colors, which is what's so neat. In between this triangle, if you go on the insides, you see the mixtures in varying degrees for the secondary colors. This would be the exact equal amounts of the yellow and the red would be this secondary um, orange, red orange. And vice, or same with all the um, um, sections of the primary colors. You've got the yellow and the blue. Of course, we know it's gonna make the green with different degrees depending on the ratios. Same here, we know that red and blue make purple. So that's kind of a neat way that you can, if you're experimenting with um, mediums such as acrylic or oil or the others that I mentioned, how you can have fewer colors um, to make a lot of colors. Uh, but again, I thought, oh, and I love this magenta color. Um, I thought it would be nice for me to go ahead, since I have these all at my disposal now, to go ahead and use a lot of them. Now, here's the little reference photo that I'm using. It's a scene that I have painted before, and I like it. It's um, from my cousin Mark, who took a beautiful picture where he lives in Virginia. And uh, sometimes doing something that's familiar to you, if you like the scene, it's good to do it over and over again. Um, now, I just did little samples of this as I was checking the colors. Um, I don't have this arranged so nicely as the color wheel, um, but I do have these in order. I've got a, a violet. I always like a nice purple, even though I could get a purple from mixing my primaries of uh, red and blue. Um, now, I did put a P here as to what my primaries are. Again, no rhyme or reason. It's just where they fell when I pulled them out of the box. Um, but I've got my primary of like an ultramarine blue, a primary of a crimson red. Crimson red's usually a pretty good standard red. And uh, I can't remember, this was just called a mid-yellow. Uh, one thing I did notice about Arteza is they don't name their colors kind of like some of the standard colors. Some of them they did, like the ultramarine blue and the crimson red, but this just called a mid-yellow instead of like a cad yellow or what you might be familiar with. Um, but anyway, if you've got a, a good eye for color, you can see them and not have to know what the name is. So anyway, so I've got a varying degrees. I've got the, this yellow would be a cooler yellow as compared to this one. This would be a warmer yellow. Um, then I've got a deep green. This is kind of a darker blue green. Then I've got a light sap green. Um, I've got a yellow green. I've got these out of order a little bit. I've got a orange red. And then I've got a raw, there's the orange red. Then I've got a raw sienna, uh, olive green. Um, again, another green out of order. Then I've got the crimson red here, ultramarine blue, cerulean blue, sky blue, uh, violet. Um, and this was a phthalo blue down here. All right, so with that, um, again, I've got a whole lot to work with just to do this uh, experiment. But what I'm going to do first, uh, this was just to sample. I'm going to go ahead and put them on my little Gray Matters paper palette. That's great because you can just tear these off and throw them away. And it's a really nice neutral surface to apply your colors to. Oh, and I failed to mention, I have me some um, of uh, values that are dark to light to sometimes I want to decrease the intensity of a color. Uh, you can either give it a tint or a shade. Um, this is the darkest that I have. It's a Van Dyke brown. This is a gray. This is this gray here. This is the Van Dyke brown. And you can't see the titanium white because it's on a piece of white watercolor paper, okay? So these will be used to either darken or lighten some of the colors that I'm working with. Now, I thought I would go ahead and show you how I actually applied these acrylics to the Gray Matters paper. I, I go ahead for the purposes of this video and arrange them more like the color wheel. I have my three primaries in a triangle 
And I always think of when you add your secondaries, um, you're just doing the triangle in the spaces. It's almost like a, uh, like a Jewish star, I think of it. Um, so now I'm just adding the different colors that would fall between those primaries. If you see me pointing, putting some on the outside, it's either because I ran out of room or I'm adding them out there for a different reason. Some of my darkest darks I'm putting on the outer edge and um, some of my kind of a more neutral color. So that's um, basically, those are my grays um, where I'm gonna lighten or darken a color there. And here are some of the basic tools I'm using, some brushes. I've already adhered the acrylic pad, the paper to the surface, water, and a pencil for sketching. I've sped up the sketch here just, you know, because it's not that interesting. <laughs> but as any other art or instruction I give, you wanna work big shapes to small shapes. You don't want to start with little detail. You want everything to be very basic and large. So that's all I'm doing is just getting in. I like I think of it as a foundation to a house or just the good bones, okay? So you don't need to get too fussy or too detailed with anything at this stage. And now I'm going to begin applying the acrylics. I'm holding the palette up a little bit at the beginning so you can kind of see how I operate. I usually mix my colors in like towards the center of the circle so I have varying degrees of values as I add white or black to it. Um, the trick about acrylic, and I've had to reacquaint myself while I was painting this, is to get a good habit of knowing how much water to add. Uh, sometimes uh, it's like you can add too much or too little too much and it's just watery and runs all over the place. Too little, it's too thick for it to move anywhere on the palette. Um, but this is serving as an underpainting. So basically this is just going to be big shapes and colors that serves as the um, kind of like the, the guide or the road map to the pastels that I will be applying later. Now I'm working with some cooler cooler greens there. Um, now there's a warmer one. Value uh, and color, uh, if you've watched my videos, you know I say this over and over again, but it's so important. Uh, important. Value decreases in the background. You're gonna get um, lighter colors in the background and you're gonna get less color. They're gonna get duller. So your greens typically they blew out, they get more blue, they get cooler, that's the other thing, okay? They get uh, lighter in value, duller, and they get cooler. So that's why that first group of trees I put down there in the back was um, a little bit of a, a teal color. That's a better color to use for background trees than a bright green. Things You just don't see bright greens in the very far distance. Um, now again, I'm just gonna continue to work on this. Notice I'm using kind of a, a bigger brush um, bigger brushes are always better to use when you're first getting started. I actually could have used a brush even bigger than that. Um, but I'm just, again, I'm, I'm examining my reference photo. I'm paying attention um, to distance in the photo. I'm also paying attention to where the sun is shining. Um, that portion I'm doing right there are some trees that are a little bit more in the shadows. So you notice the darks down um, kind of towards the base or the roots. Um, so I'm just going to work a little bit more here. Again, I'm trying to hold it up so you can see me mixing colors and uh, hopefully you get an idea of how to do basically just an acrylic underpainting.
much it for the underpainting. Um, and by the way, that unfinished part at the bottom, I just didn't bother cutting my paper off. <laughs> I wanted it to fit the dimensions of my reference photo. Now there's the palette after I finished using it. And I could keep using this. Again, I, I, I like it in the color wheel fashion. Now, what I'm doing here is applying clear liquid gesso. Now here's a product I'm adding to the clear liquid gesso. It's by Matisse. It's called Dry Pumice. It's basically like sand. You just add it to whatever liquid medium and it's going to give you more grit, more of a gritty surface. Now I'm going to give you a uh, uh, ahead of time. I'm not going to make you wait till the end to tell you what I did and did not like. <laughs> I thought this acrylic pad would need more grit than typically a piece of watercolor paper, um, but it did not. So in the future, I will not add the dry pumice. You're gonna see me mix it up here together. I use basically about a quarter of a cup of clear gesso to about a teaspoon of the pumice. What ended up resulting, uh, I'll speed this up to get to the final phase, but it, what ended up resulting was a coarse, believe it or not, I mean a, a surface, believe it or not, that was too gritty. <laughs> and so what happened was, is my pastels um, were basically getting eaten up uh, too quickly by the coarse grit. So you'll see after this painting, I'm going to speed this one up. I'm going to do another painting where I just use the clear liquid gesso, which worked much better. Okay, that's it for the gesso and pumice. Now a quick little blow dry. Here are my pastel selections. By the way, I'm using what's considered local color for this painting, even for the underpainting I did, which means it's just the color that's kind of natural to the scene. I'm not doing a complimentary underpainting or anything like that. Um, so now you're about to see what I was describing. At this point when I was doing this video, I had no idea how much it was going to eat up the pastels right there. I'm like, oh man, this is really coarse. I'm rubbing it. And um, so uh, I basically knew right away that I was going to just not do a totally completed painting. It was going to be very loose. If anything's a positive about this, it definitely helps keep you loose and painterly because your strokes just come out uh, very coarse. And uh, I, I kind of did like the resulting painting, but I didn't like the fact that um, you lose so much of your pastel. I mean, we love our pastels. We don't want them to get eaten up so quickly like that. So anyway, I'm gonna speed this up and you'll see the resulting painting when it's done. finishing this painting up at this point, getting close anyway. I apologize, it's a little more fast motion than I normally do, but it's because I'm going to show you another painting where I don't add the pumice and I'll do it a little bit slower. So all in all, I love the loose effect of this. Uh, there were some things I really liked, but I definitely would not use the pumice again. It was a little bit too coarse and too gritty and wasted up our beautiful pastels. So take two, here we go with the second painting, which if you watch the beginning of this video, it's that little wild flower painting. And I'm actually using the same palette of acrylics that you saw me using with the previous painting. And just as a note, if you haven't used acrylics very much, 
Um, there's some wonderful advantages about acrylics, but one disadvantage is, is a disadvantage is that they do dry rather quickly. So if you keep a little spritzer of water near you, you can actually just spritz a little water on top of your little dollops of acrylics, and uh, it helps keep them moist so that you can continue to use them. Um, there's all, also other kinds of little tricks you can do, but uh, I'm basically just getting in. Um, values right here. I know that the foreground is going to be darker in value. The shapes are going to be bigger. Um, I know that the depths and the roots of those flowers are cooler. I did like in that particular little reference photo, there was a coolness to the grass and um, I kind of wanted to keep that. I do add some warmer greens, but um, again, just uh, trying to get in big shapes here um, and keep it very simple. Uh, I was working quickly, even though I wasn't working this quickly, you're seeing me have sped this up, but I was working quickly because I had already done the one painting and I really was anxious to see if just the clear gesso was going to be enough grit for this acrylic pad surface that I'm using. And uh, indeed it was. And um, I think it might be the actual texture of the acrylic pad um, that has enough texture in itself so that uh, it was still eating up some of my pastels, even with just the clear gesso, not nearly as bad as with the pumice added. And one thing I did like about it is I have a tendency to be a little heavy handed with my pastel application, and this was helping, forcing me to keep a lighter touch, which uh, actually is something I, I need to focus on. And I, I liked how it made me do that here. Okay, now you can see how I am applying just the clear liquid gesso here with no additional pumice added. This is a technique I do a lot in my videos. Uh, as you probably know, if you've watched the channel long, in an attempt to help you guys save some money and myself as well, um, pastel papers can get expensive. You know pastels need the little bit of grit to hold the pastel, so this is a neat little way to add grit to your surface with the clear gesso. Now, here are my pastel selections again. And as I said before, I focus more on the cooler greens for the grasses rather than the warmer ones. Now here, I'm about to start adding the pastel. And yes, indeed, it definitely went on better. Um, it was uh, not eating up the pastels quite as much. And that little tool there, you guys ask me all the time what that is. That's a, a piece of pipe foam insulation you can buy at any hardware store. It's an excellent blending tool. I don't always blend, but uh, sometimes a sky or some mountains and things in the distance, uh, the texturalness of this was causing it to come forward in the painting and I want it to recede and go back. So that's why the blending, and I don't like to blend a lot, but that's why the blending in this particular case push those mountains back. You can already see they look more like they're in the distance now because of uh, just blending it out a little bit. But don't get carried away with the blending. You're going to, uh, when you do that, you take away from the freshness of your color. And the more you blend and the more colors you add, the more muddy your colors get. You don't want them muddy. And even though colors in the background, you want them duller, duller or less um, chromatic in color, uh, you still don't want them muddy, okay? They can be a, a lighter value and a, um, not as intense in color without making them all muddy looking. Um, if you've ever over blended, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And most of us do <laughs> when we get started. All right, so I have basically just added in some of the layers of the colors underneath and I'm getting the flowers down now. I love how Karen Margolis te teaches how um, we don't want flowers floating on the top of a painting, almost like they're pasted on, like you cut them all out and just pasted them on the top. So this is a technique to where when you put some of your flowers in before you add all your, um, your grassy textural grasses, um, you're going to layer some of those grasses on top of some of those flowers. That way they look like they're buried underneath the grasses rather than floating on the top of the grasses. Um, so uh, you can go back and reestablish your flowers after the fact if you've covered up too many you know, or whatever, but it is a good technique um, to be able to make a more realistic um, result in your final painting.
Okay, at this point, relax and enjoy. I'm going to play the music. And I've got a big thunderstorm coming right now where I live in my home studio. So I'm just going to get away from my computer for a minute and hopefully the power won't shut off. Um, while you guys enjoy the rest of this painting, I'll, I will pop back in and add some more commentary as long as um, I still have power and I'm not afraid. <laughs> All right. Thank you. 
at this point I'm wrapping it up and I, I have to apologize. I did not realize I had a setting on my camera while filming that made everything look lighter. Um, so I'm about to share uh, more of what the actual painting looked like. I put it back on the correct setting for color. So this is more accurate. This is what it looks like right now. So anyway, this was a wonderful experiment. I hope you guys learned a lot. I learned a lot. <laughs> I always, I'm learning along with you guys. So this was a lot of fun. Please try it. If you have any questions, please comment. I love your questions. Also, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed to the channel and join our Monet Cafe art group on Facebook. You're welcome no matter what level you are. Everyone is welcome in our group and we have lots of fun. All right, guys. Happy painting, and I can't wait to bring you another lesson.